and uh, when we took that emplacement, these Germans uh, came running out, their hands up, comrade, comrade, and they had on a dress uniform and their shiny boots, and we'd been crawling in that snow and wet and tired and hungry all morning long. You felt like shooting them, really. <laughs> yes. And uh, I shared this with uh, Stephen Ambrose, and it's in the uh, uh, Citizen Soldier book, if you care to look it up sometime. Yeah, also in the, uh, uh, see, uh, Victor's, the stories in that book also. And I make a statement in there where you should have shot him. <laughs> you felt like it. What was the... Uh... But uh, Ambrose goes on and tells the story that I didn't know anything about. He says that after they... Uh, they surrendered, his own troops killed their commander. I didn't know that. Hmm. But he states that in his book. I'll have to look that up. I have that book at home. You have? Citizen Soldier, yeah. Okay, I'm in there. <laughs> well, I'll look that up. Um, sounds like there was an awful lot that you saw. What was, uh, obviously you had some good times. Did you? What was the, what was the hairiest time, for you when you were over there? The time where you thought this is it. Okay, uh, it was uh, out from the the battle that we talked about in the woods. Uh, they, uh, our patrol, had taken a German patrol. What happened? This huge German was standing under the tree watching uh, one of our observation, artillery observation plane, and he was looking up, and they uh, shot him through the chest with a, a Thompson 45, and it came out his back, and I was sent uh, to take a, a bunch of prisoners back, and some of our own men that were able to walk back to the rear to the aid station. And this poor old German, uh, honest, that hole looked to me like that big in his back where he'd gone out and he'd lost so much blood. He's so weak that I didn't know whether he was going to make it or not. He wanted to stop. I don't know how many times I had to urge him on to get him to go. But uh, I took the prisoners down and uh, the wounded to the station. And uh, it was almost dark when I got back to my company. And they sent me out on the outpost. Uh, myself and another fella, and this other fella, I couldn't keep him awake. He'd go to snore, and you could hear him for, and and uh, you could hear the Germans walking around out there. They step on a stick right close to where he was at. That's the most miserable night I ever had. A time or two, I cocked my gun. I was going to shoot myself rather than give up, because I had that diary. I had it rolled up in my side pocket. And I was always more free being caught with that diary than I was in my life. And I was going to kill myself rather than let them take me prisoner. But uh, very, very close. You could hear them talking and walking around. And this outpost is way out in front of the company. Now, that's the most miserable time I ever had. Hmm. Even though those crash landings were scary, but... Uh, they were over with quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for your stories. You might want to... Uh, well, you have enough there to write you a book. I add a little to it. <laughs> Exaggerate a little. Yeah. Now, what I've told you, as far as I know, is the truth. It's not uh, some, sure. some big war story. or. Sure. And you went on, came back, and... Uh, well... Tell a story of how you got in the ministry. Tell from when you were 14, you told me, and then well, your experience over there, and then your... Okay. Uh, I uh, was on an old country boy, and they uh, had a uh, fall revival at our uh, country church, and uh, the evangelist was a rather elderly man, and he came to our house to eat the evening meal before we went to uh, service. 
back in those days, a revival would go on two weeks. Now they have a revival maybe in two or three days okay. and call it a revival. But we had a two weeks revival back then. And uh, he had preached the first week and there hadn't been a move made. And he'd come then the next Monday night to eat the evening meal with us. And they sent me over. We had a hog that we used to kill along about Thanksgiving for our meat mm -hmm. for the family. There's just three of us, Mom and Dad and myself. They sent me over to feed the hog, so the evangelist went with me. And he said to me, he said, have you ever thought about being saved? And I said, yes, sir, I have. And uh, that was about all was said when we went on to church. And he preached. And uh, uh, as he gave the invitation, I got under conviction. And so I went up and uh, accepted the Lord. And then a year later, at 15, I felt the call to preach. And I was a little old skinny, warty boy. And my picture of a preacher was a little weak backbone individual, and I, a sissy, in fact, and I didn't want to be a preacher, so I rejected the call. And that's a cause of me having to go through all of this that I've told you about. God allowed everything in the world to happen to me except take my life. I was wounded. I don't know how many times I show you scars there and in my back and different places, but nothing serious. But honest, I believe that I went through all that because I rejected the call. Well, I read my testament through one time on the trip from the States over to Africa. And after we landed from time to time, I would read a portion of it. It went on until uh, we had completed our objective in Holland, waiting for the uh, Canadians to relieve us. And they, like the British, friends, they have to have a spot of tea. They carry the teapot right on the side of the tank and they stop right in the middle of the battle and make a pot of tea. I thought they would never get there. There's no danger now, I understand, and I'm sitting in the foxhole and I'm reading my testament and I'm praying. And I eventually promised the Lord, I said, if you let me come back to the States, I'll do what you want me to do. And uh, eventually the uh, Canadians got there and relieved us. And that's when the uh, uh, truck drivers that attached to our company. We had to walk back for them to pick us up and take us uh, that to France. Well, I had to go through the Battle of the Bulge after that and uh, arrived back in the States. As you well can see that the Lord allowed me to come back to the States, but I didn't keep my promise. I went just as wild as could be. I got with a gang of boys and it was terrible. We was a drinking and carousing and man we was having time is 18 of us and uh, it so happened that I went to church this Sunday night and uh, our pastor had a we call it blowout punctured tire way down the road somewhere I don't know how far he had to walk but he didn't make it to church and our chairman of the deacon was about six foot two big tall fellow in the meantime, we had had our Bible study ready for the preaching and no preaching. <laughs> and the Lord had, in His way, impressed me. We know that we don't hear the voice of God like I'm speaking to you, but He impresses our, His way of speaking to me. He said, Clint, this is it. I'm not going to let you go any farther. I believe if I tried to walk out that night, He would have taken my life. And. I promised him again, I said, if I have the opportunity, I'll announce my calling to preach. So this deacon, chairman of the deacon, he stood up, and I'll never forget it, he looked around over the congregation, he said, I wonder if anyone has a word to say. That was my cue. I announced my calling to preach, and the next Sunday night I preached my first sermon, which is the 12th of January, 1959. And uh, shortly after I was ordained, there was 43 in the presbytery that ordained me, and those who signed my ordination papers, they're all dead now except one man. And I was called to the church. I pastored four churches continuous for 30 years. In 1989, I was supposed to have retired. But uh, since that time, I've served 10 interims. One was the two last ones was for 13 weeks, and the last one was 26 weeks, which is about as long as a country preacher stays at a place. And uh, 
in the, in that uh, period of time, uh, I have some college credit. I went to Carson Newman College, which is a Bible school, and I burned a lot of midnight oil studying. I got a, all kinds of study books. I've got the office library of uh, writers such as Billy Graham and uh, all these uh, uh, VIPs, uh, the Southern Baptists, and uh, I had, I guess, self educated myself. But uh, I, uh, the Lord really has blessed, I'll give him all the credit, he blessed our ministry. We, we have seen many, many people saved uh, and joined the church, and in every church the uh, attendance more than doubled, and we've built buildings and remodeled, and uh, he's just blessed us in so many ways. And uh, at the present time, uh, I'm serving, I'm teaching a Sunday school lesson at one of our con convalescent homes on Sunday morning at 9.30. Most of the people there is in wheelchairs, they're confined to wheelchairs, and they've taken up with me, and I can walk into that place and they'll begin to wave. Cool. And, uh, just one little bony hand say, uh, I enjoyed it today, or use a blessing to me, it's, it's worth every effort. And, and uh, one lady has gone to call me her pastor. And you, do you know that some some of them don't have anybody to come and visit with them or anything? Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's so many of our, I'm sorry to say, so many of our preachers won't even fool with a ministry like that. And uh, about six months ago, we've got two convalescent homes. The other one is called Sweetwater Nursing Home. And they call me and ask me would I come and start a Bible study on Wednesday afternoon at 2.30. So I started down there. Now over at the Woods Convalescent Home, my wife and my youngest daughter, which is with me, she goes and plays the piano. My wife and I and uh, Connie, we sang a couple of songs. I play a couple of religious tapes and they enjoy uh, that music. And then I teach the Sunday school lesson. Now down at the other place, my wife's at work, I don't have anybody to play. And two years ago, my son bought me a, a real nice RCA boombox. And I said, what in the world do I need with a boombox? Well, this came along and they invited me down to start the, the Bible study. And I started taking that and I have some real good tapes uh, that uh, I begin to play the tapes and they uh, they enjoy that we have some colored people in there and they're rather emotional and they get to patting their hands and their feet and somebody uh, made a remark about it one day about them doing that and i said well listen you got to remember that all those people in there are not baptists some of them gets excited when you talk about heaven <laughs> 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 and uh, i call it my boombox ministry <laughs> And I play about two or three tapes before I uh, have my Bible lesson. And I started in the book of John. I, I've gone through the book of John. Now I'm in the book of Acts. Now I'm over to chapter 23, the uh, two missionary journeys of Paul and uh, all the experiences he had. And uh, then I play a couple to close out. And when I leave, oh, they'll just wave and say bye-bye. And I told him last week, I said, I'll not be there. This week, I'll be gone. And he said, you be careful now. And we look for you. And uh, I, I'm really having a time down there just by myself. And then I take appointments. And uh, just as this uh, appointment came up for Sunday morning, this is a rather large church. And they're celebrating their 182nd anniversary and also their homecoming and they were seeking an elderly person to speak to them. And I had uh, been invited, they had a Veterans Day uh, at this uh, Edelwald town, and I spoke to the veterans there, and it happened to be one of the ministers from the church there had heard me speak, and I was sharing with them my experiences in combat. And uh, so I received a telephone call to come, and so I canceled out our banquet on Saturday night. I hate so bad to miss that, but uh, I hate to miss that down there too. Sure. So that's. Uh,